GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, joined by guest Carly Riley back on the show. And we believe that Sam Begman Fried is certainly not going to change the world. But we're here to carve a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. Carly, welcome back to the show. Jay, thank you so much for having me. I'm, it's great to be back here. I keep saying I've, I've been, I'm like just grateful for a place to dump all of my SBF courtroom knowledge now. My head is just spinning with details from court. Well, we're grateful that the voice of NFTs over at Overvice JPEGs has taken time out of your schedule, which I feel like is now fully dedicated to SBF. Give us a sort of rundown of what the last three weeks of your life has been like. I know you're going to the court every day. What's that like? Why do you even decide to do this? Yeah. You know, I live near to where this trial is happening, to the courthouse where it's happening. And once I realized that, I I've been interested in this case. I love a good fraud case. I was riveted from the, the moment that Tyler Schultz became a whistleblower on the Theranos case. I like tracked that whole thing. I read John Kerry's book. So this has always been up my alley in terms of just a, a an area of interest for me, this, this kind of thing. When I realized I was so close to the courthouse and where that was going to be, Knowing how quiet things have been in NFTs, you know, I wasn't really looking forward to having my fifth episode about friend tech, if I'm being honest. And I think that product is cool. <laughs> There's only so much I can say about cool. I was like, you know, what do I do? Why don't I just go? I, I initially thought it was maybe something I would just go do for a week and just check out the trial, you know, for the first week. And then I was just absolutely riveted by the whole thing. I really have loved just getting a look behind our justice system and then court system and how that works. There's a precision that I find very gratifying of like, there's certain rules to follow and they can be really semantic and irritating. And all the reasons my parents probably said that I should have been a lawyer growing up. I'm like, yes, that like resonates. And then of course, just the witnesses that we're getting and what we're hearing about what really went on has been just fascinating. And then people have been really responding to the the recap videos and, and podcasts that I'm putting out each day after court. So then of course that was gratifying, feeling like there were people who really were appreciating and, and wanting the, the coverage that I was giving. And so that combination meant that I have not missed a single day. Like I'm just there. You know, there's there's no court day. today. This week we have a couple of days off because the judge has a conference. Otherwise I'd be there right now. So are you in the courtroom? Like, where are you? Like, what's the setup? The trial is open to the public, but it's not broadcast publicly. Like, you know, the Amber Heard. Johnny it's Depp. not the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial. Yeah. That was broadcast. You can't bring electronics in, nothing. So it's, it's pen and paper. You take notes. And there's a certain number of slots, a certain number of seats in the actual courtroom itself. Folks tend to line up pretty early, like as early as like 6 a.m. in some cases to get into 5 a.m. in the early days to get into the courtroom itself. I've been into the courtroom a few times, but then when I'm not in the courtroom, I'll, I'm in an overflow room, which is where we have TVs that are broadcasting the, the trial just to those of us in the overflow rooms. So we're not in there itself. I kind of like the overflow rooms better. There's a little bit just more like flexibility. You can shift around a bit more. You know, you don't feel like you're disrupting anything if you sneeze or cough or whatever. And you get a pretty good view um, of what's going on. So so I haven't found it's really detracted from the experience, but it's, it's mm -hmm. a combination. It's week two at the on-chain gift shop where everybody gets a W just for interacting on-chain. This week, we are partnered with Hashverse, which is a game that is going to teach you, A, it's fun, but it's also going to teach you all about DeFi and trading crypto because you know what? Now is the time to get in early before the bull run comes. And Hashverse is a free game. So all you got to do this week is mint your Hashverse character. You can do so. Link is in the show notes. Go mint your Hashverse character. And when you do that, you're going to get access to the on-chain gift shop this week. Also, if you collect the Web3 Academy newsletter, any of them throughout the week, that will also get you access to the on-chain gift shop. And when you get into the on-chain gift shop, you can enter the raffle and we are giving away a Hashverse artifact item. This is an item for in the game that is valued at $500. So awesome prize to be won this week. We're also giving away a Web3 Academy hoodie and a Web3 Academy Pro membership. So much to be won at the on-chain gift shop. Go to onchaingiftshop.com right now to check out and make sure that you get in this week's raffle because everyone deserves a W in Web3.
Modern newsletters are built on Paragraph. That's right. Paragraph is a brand new newsletter platform that combines the best parts of Web 2 and Web 3 to supercharge newsletters for both writers and readers. Build a community, not just an audience. Paragraph uses blockchain tech to allow readers to collect and own the words that matter to them. This takes reading a newsletter to the next level. With Paragraph, readers can mint, collect, and show off quotes from their favorite newsletters. This opens new possibilities like creators sharing revenue with fans. I also love their new feature, Paragraph AI. This integrates GPT-4 natively in Paragraph to create, edit, and improve your writing effortlessly with one click. And guess what? We at Web3 Academy are on board and have already moved our content over to Paragraph. We believe this is the future of newsletters because of the profound engagement it creates between creators and fans. So whether you're a creator, writer, or an avid reader, it's time to check out Paragraph and capitalize on the opportunity of being early. Okay, so you've been there every day. Where are we roughly in the trial? We're like midway through the trial? Yeah, midway through or a little over midway through. So the, the, okay. the prosecution is expected to finish their case maybe even this week, Thursday and Friday of this week, when we're back in session, it could overflow a little bit into the following week. And then the defense will mount their case. I, I only hesitate there because the defense has indicated, like they've, they've used terms like if we put on a case, which is wild to hear, but I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. <laughs> I, I expect Sam will testify. So I, I think they obviously will mount a case, but that language has confused a lot of people are like, what, what the hell? In any case, the defense will, will make their case probably starting next week and maybe go into a little bit the following week. So probably have two and a half weeks left of this and we're about three weeks in. Okay. Okay. And let's just take a step back. What's your overview so far? What's your feeling? Where is the wind blowing? Yeah. Overview so far is definitely that the prosecution is like cleaning house. I really tried to come into this case with an open mind. I continue to try and have an open mind. Like I'm, I'm actually looking forward to the defense putting on a case because the defense is in a tough position just trying to make their case simply by cross-examining witnesses that are friendly to the prosecution, right? Like they're clearly trying to get witnesses to to testify in a certain way, the defense will in their cross-examination. But these witnesses are also very smart individuals. These are smart young people and, and smart people all around. So they are savvy enough to often not let themselves be taken wherever the defense would probably ideally like them to go. So I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that I think the defense has an uphill battle right now while they're just, where they, all they can do is, is cross-examine prosecution's witnesses. So I'm excited for their own defense and their own case to be put on. But my God, is it is it painful? And I was saying this to you before, like even talking to more experienced court reporters, folks who have, who have seen a lot of trials, talking to other lawyers who are there as members of the public watching this trial play out, the consensus is really just that defense has been really, really weak. And to, it, it's hard at, uh, oftentimes to even know what point they're trying to make in their crop. Really? Why are we? Yeah, I, on my notebooks, I have literally like three notebooks that are almost all full of the notes <laughs> I take while I'm there. And half the time when during the cross-examination, I'm writing like point question mark and I'm speculating as to what they're trying to get across. And I'm somebody who's making content about this. So I'm really trying to make sure I understand the point. You're a jury member. I don't know that you're doing that level of mental work on behalf of the defense to try and figure out what they're trying to to say to you. We can talk, you know, maybe in a little bit about, I think some wins the defense has had too, but they're just so small compared to the prosecution who has this really tight, concise story that they've had witness after witness mm -hmm. corroborate essentially. And now some of the witnesses have deals already done, right? Yes. And that would obviously impact their prep and their lead up they would be i'm assuming working with the doj on the deal so they would really understand like they would be very well prepped coming into this as opposed to a, somebody who comes up to give a defense in a case where they just you know they they weren't necessarily also committing crime right because is it gary and caroline is it just gary Wang and caroline that have been the shot so actually in the shot a lot of witnesses we've heard from have had cooperation uh, oh, wow. okay. We actually heard on Thursday from Kan Sun, who was the general counsel for FTX, who had a non-prosecution agreement. Now, you know, he, he says that he didn't do anything illegal, certainly not knowingly, but because he did a variety of things that may have, without his knowing, been mm -hmm. caught up in illegal, he wanted a non-prosecution agreement. But Gary, Nishad, and Caroline all have cooperation agreements. Adam Yadidia, who's one of Sam's like 
high school good friends, like one of his oldest buddies, or at least college, maybe maybe they didn't go as far back in high school, but one of his, his close friends who was a senior engineer, a senior software engineer at FTX, who also claims he had no idea about what was going on. He also had a cooperation agreement just out of an abundance of caution. And that is definitely a point the defense is is really trying to hammer home with each of these witnesses. In fact, some of their strongest cross-examination has come when they're making the point that there's this conflict of interest because all of these witnesses have a deal with the prosecution where the prosecutors will write a letter to the judge. I think it's called a K-5 letter or something, something like that. That'll basically outline what they have done to help the prosecution in this case. And the judge will take that into account when determining mm-hmm. each of the guilty parties, at least, each of the guilty parties' sentences. The only three who have pled guilty are Nishad, Caroline, and and Gary. But a lot of these witnesses have, again, non-prosecution agreements or other kinds of cooperation agreements. And the last thing I'll say on this is I think my takeaway has been not that I think this conflict of interest has meant that any of the witnesses are lying for the prosecution. I, I really don't think it, you know, the it's stipulated that they have to tell the truth. Like their their cooperation agreements actually are null and void if they lie on the stand. Now, mm. the defense's point is, well, sure, but who's going to prosecute for lying? It's the prosecution. So if you're lying in a way that is helping the prosecution, the odds that they're going to go and come after you for it, pretty slim. But I don't think any of these witnesses are lying. What I do think has happened is that, as you said, they've met with the prosecution now, the DOJ, for nine, 10 months at this point. They've met with them 20 plus times a piece for many hours at a time so that their stories now are each very concise, very crystallized, very easy to understand, very simple. Whereas I imagine, and we've seen some glimmers of this when they first were meeting with the prosecution in December of 2022, January of 2023, things were a lot muddier. Well, they were more human. They were like, I can't quite remember this. And well, the reason we did that was F, Y, or Z. And suddenly now their stories are like, Perfect. They're so beautiful. Yeah. And again, I don't think they're lying, I, but I do think that you see that and you're like, that's because you've been working with prosecution for eight months. And mm-hmm. there is something to that that feels like there's a bias there. For sure. For sure. The more you prep your story, the more crystal becomes in your mind. And Correct. let's be honest, memories are always inaccurate. And so right. you start to remember the story the way it goes. Okay. What are the smoking guns so far? What's the most damning evidence? Oh my gosh. So I I would say there's two categories here. There's the most compelling things we've heard in court, which in my opinion have often been the stories from Nishad. I think Nishad was honestly the star witness, which is interesting because everyone thought Caroline was going to be the star witness. And I can talk about why I think Nishad has actually been better than Caroline. But the most compelling parts were stories that we've heard from folks, which ultimately are hearsay, which is Mm -hmm. from what I would call like the real smoking gun, which is We've looked at the code base. We've seen like little snippets of code written that demonstrate that Alameda had certain special privileges on FTX, demonstrating that they could withdraw as much money as they wanted to from the FTX exchange, which is something that Alameda distinctly had the ability to do, distinct from any other customer of FTX, or looking at the terms of service and actually looking at where it said that FTX wouldn't touch your digital assets that you deposited with them. Or in in a case on Thursday, we had a witness who was a forensic accountant who went into all of their bank accounts and like basically looked at the money flows from FTX and Alameda and put together these flow charts showing exactly what percent of money or like, you know, at least this is a random example, but like at least $27 million out of the $45 million in total that Sam spent investing in Skybridge Capital, which is which is a VC fund, at least $27 million of that $45 million we know came from customer money. And so like, in some ways, that can be hard to describe and it's, it, it can be mm-hmm. you know, a little bit less interesting in some ways. It's just like a lot of charts and a lot of graphs. But those are like, it feels like the real smoking guns. And we've had some really interesting testimony and I can get into that if you want around from like Nishan and, and others. Yeah, let's let's hear with more sexy fun stories. Fun's the, the wrong word. Stories. But the, yeah, the crazy stories. So I will say this, there's the few key points of time that have clearly become important in this whole thing. I would say June of 2022 is the first one because June of 2022, you have the crypto markets have imploded because of Terra Luna, which happened in May of 2022. And so there were a number of meetings between Caroline on the Alameda side and then Gary and Nashad and Sam, you know, I guess arguably on the FTX side, though Sam owned 90% of Alameda and was 
by everyone's account, effectively still running Alameda, honestly, Mm -hmm. or at least making the big decisions when it came to Alameda. There were a bunch of meetings that happened in June to like get their accounting straight and like really understand what. And and what came out of that was that Alameda owed eleven billion dollars to FTX. That FTX cost it in June of twenty twenty two. And, and this is like written down, like, is there in text, is there an email or? There are spreadsheets that say it. They all use euphemistic language. They've all testified that Sam was very specific about, we only communicate on Signal, which mm-hmm. has disappearing messages. Like Sam has done a, an actually reasonably okay job at cover his ass. That I, like <laughs> there's no Signal messages. This is why so much of this is hearsay. Okay. And the spreadsheets don't explicitly say anywhere FTX customer money. Like, you know, they'll say like, the, you know, they kind of use the other language and things, but you have all of his senior people testifying to like, well, he absolutely knew what all of it yeah. meant. Like it, it would just defy all logic that Sam, who we have proof in a whole bunch of other ways, was very much captain of these ships, right? <laughs> didn't know what FTX borrows meant, right? And didn't know that it was customer money. Like it just, it defied the logic. And so some of the, the smoke and gun stuff. So in June of 2022, Adam Yadidia, who was this senior engineer, testified to having a conversation with Sam on paddle tennis courts. These like luxury tennis courts. We saw pictures of them in the Bahamas. And he had, for reasons related to some coding he was doing, seen some of the numbers and was like a little, was nervous about them and, and didn't know what to make of them. And allegedly asked Sam specifically like, hey, like, are we all good? And he said he, he, he was specifically in the context of money that Alameda owed to FTX. Mm-hmm. And this was in June of 2022. Sam said, we were bulletproof last year, but we're not this year. And then Adam said, how long will it be until we're bulletproof again? And he said, six months to three years. So that was in June of 2022. That was definitely kind of, that was the Adams was one of our first testimony we got. So that was interesting. And then the other key moment, and I'll, I'll highlight this as an example, was in September of 2022. It becomes like the next moment in this timeline that I think really stands out. In September, Sam was considering, wanted to maybe shut down Alameda. Basically, Bloomberg hmm. wrote a story interrogating the relationship between the two firms and really scrutinizing that relationship and feeling uncomfortable with it. And Sam had gone to great lengths to demonstrate, to, to suggest that these were totally separate entities. He said it's right. all investors. He said it publicly. I don't run Alameda. I have nothing to do with Alameda, which was a, well, absolutely not true, as, as we now know, kind of on the back end. So in September of 2022, we sort of floating the idea of, of closing Alameda down because of the PR risk of it. Mm-hmm. And so once again, the team went and investigated and came back to Sam and were like, they owe us $14 billion dollars we can't out until like we hope we like we absolutely can't do it that that 11 billion dollars that was owed in june had ballooned to 14 billion dollars come september and so in september it was at this point that nashad claims that is when he really learned like he learned explicitly that this was ftx money that was being uh, customer money that was being used Mm -hmm. to fund alameda like he had thought alameda was just really profitable because he wasn't actually Mm -hmm. like on the inside of that which sam very much was like sam was involved Mm -hmm. in the trading decision he knew that this was not all profits in a way that nashad did not realize but in september nashad in doing this investigating to figure out if they should shut down Alameda, Nishad learns, oh my God, they've been using FTX customer money. And he confronts Sam about it. And this was really compelling testimony. He describes being on one of their balconies in the luxury apartment they all lived in in the Bahamas, a $35 million apartment that was 100% funded by customer money through customer money. He's on the balcony with Sam. And so initially he starts it off just being like, um, how concerned should I be about this, this hole in the balance sheet? And at first, Sam tries to demure and is like, oh, it's specifically, uh, and Nishad said, like, I'm, I'm concerned about this NAV situation. I'm very nervous about this NAV situation. NAV meaning net asset value, which he testified was his shorthand way of saying, like, the hole in the balance sheet. But NAV technically means, like, you know, basically, like, assets minus liabilities. Like, you have more positive assets than you have liabilities. So Sam sort of was like, oh, don't worry about it. NAV is positive. Well, not as positive because you were counting things like FTT, which they held $3 billion mm-hmm. of, but which was FTX's native token that if you actually tried to sell $3 billion of yeah. on the market, the price would implode. So like, there was all sorts of BS calculations you were doing. Even suggest that NAV was positive at the time, which Sam is smart enough to have known. Like, There's no way I could figure out that you can't mm-hmm. consider $3 billion worth of FTT as part of assets. I know Sam could have. But then Nishad presses further and is like, okay, but what about this specifically this $14 billion hole that Caroline and Gary were talking about today to all of us. You were there, bro. And that's when Sam was like, right, that, yeah, 
it's been weighing on me. I've been five to ten percent less productive this year because of it. <laughs> what a robotic yeah, answer. Like, <laughs> like, quantify exactly how less productive I've been. But I'm also gonna claim that I'm I'm gonna answer things like that, but I'm also such an idiot. I lost eight billion dollars and oopsie whoopsie, I don't know where it went and it wasn't my fault, which has been what he's tried to claim, you know, subsequent to, to everything collapsing. He says, I've becoming I've become I've been five to ten percent less productive because of this. Rashad says it's gonna affect me a lot more than that like i <laughs> quite disturbed by this information what is the plan like what are we going to do and sam was like i'm you know I'm, I'm trying to raise more money he he you know shortly after this conversation did go to saudi arabia he was trying to raise from muhammad salman and the saudis he's like i'm trying to raise more money but the best thing we can do is basically just continue to grow the company to the point where we can ultimately sell the whole because the company has grown and we got more profits which is obviously like a horribly unsatisfying answer if you're Nishad. Nishad said he didn't resign at the time because he was afraid that it, you know, he was a key part of the whole of everything. And he felt if he resigned, then the odds that customers would never make, get their money back was even higher versus if he stayed and actually tried to like build and make the company whole. Maybe they could fill in the, the whole whatever. I mean, you know, he's testifying. So that's obviously a generous interpretation of things. But by all accounts, other people have said this as well. Nishad was somebody at the company who was like very torn up about this and was a good guy who like really uh, kind of believed the effect of altruism stuff and it wasn't just like speak pr speak for him in any case so that was pretty smoking gun was hearing like that conversation because again there's not a lot you can like explicitly peg sam to where he's like acknowledged this stuff but these right. conversations if you believe the witnesses and i find nishad very reliable it's pretty clear Sam knew what was going on and had known for a while. Again, he said, I was five, I've was i been five to 10% less productive basically this year because of this, in, indicating he knew that Caroline says that he was using customer money from the start of FTX, that there was never really between these things. Yeah. She said when she was at Alameda in 20, 2018, 2017, and then FTX started in 2019, out, out the gate, Sam always used customer money, which is actually why I think Caroline's testimony was less effective than Nishad's because my sense is the use of customer money was so baked into their processes, even by the time she'd become CEO of Alameda, they never had an explicit conversation about it. Like, it was just the way they operated. It was so under the surface and just like the implicit thing that in the spreadsheets she was sharing that we saw in court, customer money is being used, but it's not said anywhere there. It was like, it didn't even need to be brought up. It was always the way they had done. Things. Whereas Nashad didn't know that was always the way things were done. So when he confronted it in September of 2022, he actually had an explicit conversation with Sam about it because it wasn't background noise to him. It was a new information. It was new. It, it just feels so clear from the outside, and I'm sure from your position too, that Sam knowingly was consistently breaking the law. So what's the defense even trying to do? Like, how does, is there any defense here? Like, now I'm kind of maybe understanding why they might be saying, like, if there's a defense. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the thing too, like in, in defense of this response, like they have a hard case. <laughs> like, yeah. I think they're I, it's guilty. I, I mean, the defense's case, and we got glimpses of this in, in the things that Sam has said about himself, you know, or that he said himself prior to stopping and we're not talking to the press anymore because he was being held in the Manhattan Detention Center, right? Was was just trying to pretend that he didn't know that, oh, you know, I, I relied on all these people to handle the decision for me. I had a million things going on. I really wasn't tracking this closely. And, you know, he's claimed he never explicitly, for example, told Caroline to return money to third party lenders. That was a big thing, like that ballooning of the hole between 11 billion and 14 billion mm -hmm. from June to September. A large part of that was that they had repaid third party lenders that were asking for their money back from mm -hmm. Like Gemini and, and BlockFi, yeah, Celsius. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's some level of debate about how explicitly Sam was the one who said to return that money, which would have inherently meant using customer money. Uh, you know, and, and look, I, I think there's a, a smidge of legitimacy there in the sense that it is interesting. If you believe that Sam knew in June, as I do, the size of the hole and that Alameda was using FTX customer money, it's interesting that a few months later in September, he would circulate a memo asking to look into shutting down Alameda. It does mm -hmm. show that on some level in his head, it wasn't all totally connected up. Like he did not realize the extent to which things had gotten so out of control. And I, I think it's easy for us to sit there and listen to a story of FTX told exclusively for the purpose of convicting somebody of something and told explicitly, like only through the lens of 
the key beats being when did he know about customer money stuff mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and to be like oh my god this was looming so large how the hell he's so guilty but if you go back in time and you put yourself in his position at the time you have 30,000 things happening mm-hmm. in your life uh, running as ceo of alami uh, as ceo of ftx over the course of 2022 that these moments aren't standing out to you the way they are to us when we're hearing it now through witnesses mm-hmm. and that he, he may have been hearing this information but had 10 trillion things on his mind wasn't really focused on how perilous this whole thing was mm-hmm. so that's me being really generous and as, as generous as i can be to him at the end of the day it comes down to he knew customer money was being used he knew he was using it explicitly when he made a bunch of illiquid venture investments and that's the crime and the terms mm-hmm. of service that they couldn't do it so like mm-hmm. they weren't going to do that so whether or not it got bigger than he realized, even though he was being told how big it was, whether or not that hadn't fully sunk in for him, doesn't really matter in my view as to his guilt. But it's the best you have, I think, in terms of, of a, a defense. Yeah. And I guess how much of a defense is that, right? right? You know, like, great. You knowingly broke the law. You knowingly took steps in this direction. Maybe you didn't know the magnitude of it. Like, does that really, it's black or white at that point, right? Like, whether you stole, uh, you know, a billion dollars or you stole 14 or 16 billion, like, what's the difference? Like, you, right. I thought you I lied. You broke the law. Me that nobody would notice it, right? Like, that's yeah. all. Yeah. But I thought I had it enough under control that nobody would notice that I had taken this money. It's like, it's so, sort of what you're talking about at a certain point, which is really not compelling at all. Now, Sanders also, in statements he's made prior to the trial, tried to act like this was all margin, right? FTX was, could take money from customers that were trading on margin, trading using leverage, putting up collateral, losing losing collateral. And he has tried to suggest, he did this when he went, he went on Good Morning America with George Stephanopoulos and tried to say this, like, it was all because of this margin stuff and, and F- oh, Alameda just had a bigger margin position and there were all these, the, the press usually has done a very effective job at, in my opinion, like pointing out like, no, no, no. Like this went well beyond margin. In fact, this was interesting testimony. Pan Sud, who was the general counsel for FTX, testified that he learned about the use of customer money in November as everything was blowing up. He didn't know about this at all until things were literally imploding, at which point he was given a balance sheet to look at that for the first time and was like, wait, what the hell? And then started asking mm-hmm. follow-up questions, at which point it dawned on him that they were using FTX customer money. And Sam asked him to come up with legal justifications for the money that was missing, the $8 billion that was missing. He was trying, Apollo, he was trying to raise money from Apollo Capital. He sent Apollo a balance sheet that didn't say this is FTX customer money, but showed this hole. And Apollo came back to him. This was in like November 7th. This is like right as everything was blowing up. Apollo came back to him and said like, hey, what's the legal reason that this money is missing? So he then went to his general counsel and was like, hey, I need to come up with legal justifications for this money to be missing. And Ken wow, to him, the general counsel came back to him. They they went on a walk together, and Ken was like, "There is no legal justification." So like, you know, <laughs> theoretical reasons that we could take customer money, and I'll explain those to you. But none of them stack up with the facts and the reality of the situation here. The first theoretical justification was dormant accounts. He said, "Look, if an account was dormant for a certain, over a certain period of time, and we couldn't get in touch with the person, we could charge them latency fees." Mm-hmm. They didn't have an eight billion dollar for the latency fees. Like, they didn't have that many inactive accounts on FTX. Second, what he told him was theoretically th- there could be a, you know the lend borrow program, the margin program, these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But the amount of money that was in within the margin program doesn't come close to the amount of money that's missing. And then the third justification, I actually am like what the third one was. It was honestly the least interesting one to me. In any case, what's so fascinating is Sam then went and ran with that lend borrow excuse, like on Good Morning America, like he yeah, said and- a number of times talking about oh it was this margin thing. I don't know if he had bought it out beforehand or if it was literally in this conversation with his general counsel that he got the idea to be like, this is how I'm going to justify this, even though I have a general counsel being like, this is definitely not what happened. But just so you know, like theoretically, you would be entitled to certain amounts of money because of this. So it's really interesting going back. I just did this this morning, going back and listening to some of his old statements, mm-hmm. because at the time, it's not necessarily his Good Morning America appearance, but there were times where I, I felt like he was interviewed where he is kind of compelling sounding where you're like, oh, maybe he did just like lose track of some stuff. And it was just like an oopsie whoopsie. And like, <laughs> who knows, you know, like, which is what he had said. And when you go back and you listen to what he said and you compare it to what we've learned over the course of this trial, it, it, he just looks manipulative to me. Right. Like, lie, like a, mm-hmm. a lie, but that you're trying to kind of make, but there's a grain of truth to it, right? Mm-hmm. You're referencing something real. There was a bug in the code base that miscounted one of the accounts by $8 billion. That was real. I can get, you know, like, but it doesn't at all 
make the point you're now trying to make it sound like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Which really shows his character, yeah. which I don't think should surprise any of us. A highly intellectual sociopath, psychopath. Like I don't know, you know, what the difference really, which one you categorize them as, but very common for like highly intellectual people who have large egos who start to when you are on top of the world the way he is and everyone's throwing money at him and you start to just believe your own bullshit, right? Yeah. And everyone around you, especially the way, I mean, the fact that he put his girlfriend and I don't, I know, you know, where they girlfriend, boyfriend or what their relationship were, was, the were fact that, friends. right. Yeah. And the, yeah. And the fact that Caroline was the CEO, like that just doesn't add up to me. Like that shows how manipulative you are. Yeah. Nobody w- would put their own, girlfriend as the CEO of their of a company that they own like that's not that's what you do when you want to control somebody yes and she testified she tried to resign she explicitly denied to resign in 2022 and she says he told her no we can't do this without you like you're too critical here like basically push back we played the plays the boyfriend card (laughs) yeah I mean you know it's a they were broken up at that time but I think it it feels like she had more feelings for him than he had for her she she's Mm -hmm. kind of bad too and I do think that he probably knew the power he wielded in that relationship and I was able to keep her on board. Uh, but what's so interesting about that is he now wants to claim, well, this is all Caroline Ellison's fault. She was incompetent. She didn't know what she was doing. She was bad at leading Alameda. And it's like, oh, interesting because she testified and I fully believe her that she literally tried to quit. And you told her, oh, you're so important. And this was in like late 2022. Right. Oh, no, you can't quit. You have to stay. You can't leave. We need you. And now in hindsight, you want to say how incompetent she was and how right. you're not at fault. Because she was so bad and she's at fault. Which, by the way, like speaking of character, and I actually don't know if I think he's a sociopath or if I think he's somebody who's very arrogant, who has a really dangerously high risk tolerance and Mm -hmm. who has a conscience and may actually feel guilty about everything that's happened. So he's not like a total sociopath in that Mm -hmm. sense, but really just was not at all thinking about customers in this situation, was just being very selfish and was just his risk appetite is, again, dangerously high, you know, for somebody who also then was given control of a lot of money. But what I think speaks so much to his character is that this is somebody who was more than willing to take all the glory, all the fame, be on every magazine cover, hobnob with every cool celebrity he could when things were good. And then the second things went bad, he was like, not my fault, not my fault. I didn't know anything. It was everybody else's fault. It's all my underlings' fault. And each one of these people has testified to how much they just ran all the big decisions by Sam. How much, he, like, none of these people acted really independently. And they were always just going to Sam for all the big choices, including Alameda. We heard testimony from an Alameda senior engineer at Alameda who was like, I always was under the impression that Sam was running the show. Like I reporting to Caroline, but Sam talked, he would sometimes directly talk to traders at Alameda and tell them trades to place. Like he was still clearly the one still pulling the strings. And so as soon as things go bad, like even if he was less at fault, even if Sam was less at fault than I believe he is, a captain goes down with their ship. You own Alameda, you still have FTX. Like you take responsibility for this now that everything's gone to hell because you took all the glory when things were good. It can, it can, yeah, I, t- I totally agree. I mean, but I also, I see why oopsie whoopsie feels like the easiest, the only thing he can really stand on is, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't me point finger at somebody else. So when the defense starts their case, which as you said, will probably be in about a week, the big question everyone's talking, will Sam Bankman free testify? Do you think he will? Do you think he should? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think he will. And I almost kind of think he should. <laughs> I mean, I, I think he will because, again, this is somebody with a very high risk appetite. Mm-hmm. We've made some of the comparisons to Elizabeth Holmes. I think Elizabeth Holmes is actually more sociopathic, potentially, mm-hmm. than Sam is. I, I don't really think she has a conscience, but I think that she and Sam are similarly like arrogant and think they're the smartest person in the room and, and Elizabeth mm-hmm. testified in her own trial. And you could argue it actually may have helped her. I don't know. I mean, she got a, a more lenient sentence than she could have had. And so I think Sam's risk appetite and his arrogance will certainly make him want to testify for himself. He also clearly wants to set the record straight. We've seen that in all of the media appearances he's doing. I also think, as much as I really don't think favorably of him, I think he's a more nuanced person than the person that is presented expli- like exclusively mm-hmm. in a court case like this. And so if if you're a juror and you a lot of these jury jurors, in, in fact, maybe all of them had said they had never really heard about FTX or this case before this. So they certainly haven't previously seen interviews with Sam. Like the impression you're going to get is like this person's awful. Like you're just hearing about the worst of everything they've ever done. You're seeing the worst snippets of, you know, DMs that have been leaked, the worst snippets of him on, on Good Morning America. 
And just there's a very natural human instinct at that point to want to get up there and be like, hey, I'm a little bit more complicated than the person you've seen. And that's maybe partly why I, I do think he should testify. I know I would have that urge if I, you know, I'm in any of the stuff that works out and I don't have the risk appetite that he has. And I would still be like, I want to get my my story out there, like my version of me out there. And, and then the final thing I'll say is I just don't think he has that much to lose. It's, it's sort of the consensus among people who have, who've been in this trial. It's like, he's so screwed at this point. Like it, mm-hmm. it, maybe he'll get acquitted on a couple of of charges. Like maybe he doesn't get commodities fraud, the charge or whatever. But, you know, the bulk of these, it's seen, it would be shocking if he wasn't found guilty for. So like, what does he have to lose in some ways? It's mm-hmm. the argument. So that's why I think he will. And it's kind of why I think he should. But maybe I'm just, I want him to so badly. Like I'm so excited to hear that survives. Which makes you, that's why I, why I say this. But that's what I guess. Yeah, I think it would be great for I mean, it'd be great, great for content. you and great for all of us. It's great content. I hope he t- yeah, I hope he testifies too. Okay. I'm curious just to take a step back now. What has this experience taught you, if anything? Like you mentioned, uh, I don't know if it was early in the show or if it was actually maybe before we were recording how you've sort of given you an eye and a view into the American judicial system. Like that's interesting. How have you been feeling through this and what sort of, what have you been your takeaways outside of this? I have a tremendous amount of respect for the process, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, well, first of all, in some ways it is like what you see on TV. You know, in some ways it's not. And, and on, in a lot of ways you're like, this is, you know, they object and then they, you know, like there's like yeah. all the things that you see and seeing that being like, this is how it really plays out is interesting. If you've seen the reality show, the jury, I can't remember what, it, what the show was called, but it was like, it, it, it became kind of like po- popular and it's like that. So for example, the first two days were jury selection. And it was so interesting to see the questions that would get asked to the jurors and the judge really pushed back. I mean, what was so striking was watching individuals clearly trying to get out of jury duty and the judge not just taking their excuses. It wasn't like you could just stand up and be like, oh, I have a trip scheduled and my flights are already booked. Like, I, I can't do it. The judge would be like, are they refundable? Are the tickets refundable? What's the trip for? Somebody had a wedding to go to. They're like, whose wedding is it? How close are you? How close are you to the, to the person who's getting married? And it was like, uh, my husband's work colleague. And he's like, yeah, I'm in the books, right? Like, and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting that there, there's a strictness to that and a real sense that like, no, you've been called for jury duty. You're obligated to serve this unless you have a, a really legitimate excuse. And I mean, just the fact that we take like 12 random strangers and just like, or like decide the fate of this dude. And I kind of love that. I think there's something really beautiful about that. All the side skirmishes that happen between the prosecution and the defense are really interesting. What can be admissible in court? Right. This the other thing the defense is struggling with. There's a number of things that Sam wants to admit once as part of his defense that the judge has ruled is is irrelevant and he's not letting in. And I think there's one that's it's still up for debate, but like Anthropic, for example. So Sam made a five hundred million dollar investment in this AI company, Anthropic, using customer money. That's now like worth a lot more. <laughs> like, right. Right. Return all the money to customers with that now because he declared bankruptcy. That might not be the case, but in any case, the, the point being like. Things like that, that Sam once admitted that the, the judge hasn't ruled if that's admissible or not. And so basically what he's saying, like, if I return all the money, then like, it doesn't right. matter that I broke the law. Exactly. I was having this conversation with somebody before. It doesn't actually change the criminality of this. Right. I think his hope would be that it would be a distraction for the jury. That if the jury heard like, oh, wait, they have enough money to cover customers. Like, really, what was the crime here? Right. It's- Which... Could Which happen. isn't necessarily true, though, right? Like, are they actually covering all customers funds? No. Well, you know, this is where I, I don't know all the specifics. I believe the value of their anthropic share is something on the order of like $7 billion now. So if that could be made liquid, it would just about cover the customers. And there's probably other money that they've you know been able to sell off at this point. So they would be able to make customers whole. The problem is now that they declared bankruptcy, that's not how it works anymore. There's a list of creditors. creditors. There's lawyers that are going to get a cut. Right. Like, and customers get it last. They regret. Basically. Yeah, Sam has said his biggest regret is fi- filing for Chapter 11 for filing for bankruptcy because he felt like it became clear to him pretty quickly after he did that, that there was money that was going to come through that could have covered customers. But that as soon as he filed Chapter 11, that process suddenly becomes much less clear cut. So it's unclear. Uh, you know, apparently in the markets right now, the claims, you know, buying the Alameda or buying the FTX debt, it's up to like 52 cents on the dollar right now, which is actually higher than it was. So the betting markets have basically said that. They're more optimistic than they used to be that this money, some of this money is coming back or a chunk of the money is coming back. In any case, so seeing these side skirmishes are interesting. I mean, they had a they had a fight in court the other day. The defense is trying to motion for Sam to get more out. He wants to have- Yeah, what happened with this? I'm so curious about this. So Sam 
I think took about 30 milligrams of Adderall typically is what he had claimed he was taking during the height of the FTX stuff. Maybe it was more than that. And he would take like extended release. I think it was a combination of like extended release and instant release Adderall. Now, because like Adderall shortages and things, he's only really able to get the instant release. And I think he's basically uh, uh, permitted to have like 10 milligrams of instant release at the top of the day. So the defense is claiming that by midday, it's like worn off for him and he really can't focus and he can't participate in his own defense as well as he needs to be because he's not getting enough Adderall. So they wanted the judge to allow him to have more Adderall and to have a break in the middle of the day to get a second Adderall break or whatever. And then the prosecution came back and argued that the doctor that had evaluated him many, many months ago and claimed that he needed all his Adderall is like a shit doctor who <laughs> over prescribes Adderall and they have like, you know, proof that this and we're like, yeah, no, I'm probably, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but they prove that this doctor over prescribes and that he even if he says he needs 30, he doesn't really need 30. And then you have the judge being like, look, I'm not a doctor either way. But basically that the, this evaluation that had happened was too, like he, he needed more up-to-date information that this wasn't like current enough. So he denied the defense's motion to basically get another break and to get more Adderall for Sam. And he was like, this is a, a question for doctors to answer and like go get him evaluated again and maybe he can get more Adderall. I don't know. You know we're not going to pause the trial until he can get more Adderall basically. Yeah. So he decided. Which, thank, thank you. Like, the fact that this Adderall conversation was even a conversation to begin with just feels, I don't know, like, come on, man. W wouldn't we all be great if we took Adderall? Like, yeah, we not. Wouldn't we all be better if we were yeah. forced with amphetamines? I mean, you know, I do understand if if he really does have really severe ADHD, which I imagine is less severe than he claims, if I'm being yeah. honest. Imagine he, whatever. Uh, he's just like a millennial who played too many video games and now said exactly. or whatever. It's like probably the switch, but I don't know. And so... I do understand that it is hard. I mean, look, sitting in court for eight hours sucks. It's not great to have to sit and listen to somebody talk for eight hours. And you have somebody who, so like Sam, who had been, who was used to be able to play video games. He was playing video games when anybody talked to him throughout right. Rattled FTX, it, it seemed like. Yeah. So I'm sure this is hard. And I'm sure it means that he's not able to focus as much as he would like to or pay his close attention, which means he's not giving the best information he can to his attorneys or something. I don't know. And I mean, that's the generous case for it, in which case, like, you want him to be able to participate fully. Like, I want him to have a fair trial and whatever, but. You know, at a certain uh, point, this, this judge pulls no punches, like, yeah. which works against the defense in a lot of cases. And I think even in the style, the defense wants to have this particular style where they they're kind of repetitive in their questions. They repeat a lot of questions that the prosecution had asked as a way to try and build and yes. something and get the story told again, but in a slightly more generous way. Mm. But the judge is like not having it. He does not like repetitive questions. Because a listener is nice because it's annoying to hear repetitive questions. But I think has stymied and kind of cut the defense off at the knees in terms of what they what their rhetorical strategy was going to be with all of this. And the, the defense clearly is very frustrated, or the the judge is very frustrated with the defense, which also does not help the defense. Like if the most trusted source of truth in the room, being the judge, is f constantly frustrated with the defense, it kind of makes Sam look bad too. It makes the whole team look awful. It doesn't help at all. We okay initially we're like maybe he's just gonna like maybe this is all strategy to just get like a mistrial and like based on like mm. defense you know what i mean like i don't think not, they're not that bad they haven't like you know missed motions or whatever but they are in the it was like so glaringly like really strange how ineffective it felt like the cross examinations were that people were sort of semi-jokingly asking that can i ask you to make a prediction i mean you know what i haven't done and I, what I'll, I'll do at some point is actually look at i think it's seven counts that he's seven, been yeah. accused of or, or whatever and I, I need to actually look at each specific count what's required to be guilty for that count like some of the, consp the conspiracy charges all require intent there's a little bit of mixed information out there about whether like a wire fraud charge like an explicit wire fraud charge not just a conspiracy charge around wire fraud requires intent so i i want to kind of look at each of those things and then stack it up against the evidence to really decide like Will he get acquitted on one of these? Is he guilty on all of them? For example, there's he, he's been charged with commodities fraud. And there's an argument that maybe the case for commodities fraud is kind of weak only because has it really been established if Ethan Bitcoin are commodities? Is sort of commodities, like, maybe. Yeah. But... So, so I don't have like a specific prediction for you of like, he's going to be guilty on five counts and acquitted of two. Right. I'll certainly predict that. I think he'll be he'll be found guilty. I, I don't want to make a prediction on sentencing yet either because I do think if he testifies... I think at this point, the best he can hope for is that uh, if he testifies and it goes better for him than other people expect, mm -hmm. that it might make for a more lenient sentence. This judge will determine his sentence. I think he's going away for a while. There's also obviously a question of like, 
how much of a threat to society is he really? Like at this point, I said to somebody, I think he could raise money again because I don't think venture markets love a good old smart for sure kid, whether he's a criminal or not. They love a good MIT grad who's built a company, even if he defrauded customers of $8 billion. So I'm sure he could raise again, but I do think the guardrails around him would be such that I don't know that he could commit a major fraud again. Who knows though? So that, that's like a tricky thing when you think about sentencing. Like how does the judge weigh what's deserved from like a deterrence perspective? What's deserved from like a you're a real threat to society perspective? What does that mean he should get? You know, I think he's up for 115 years or something. Holy shit. Here's like the, the max sentence he's facing, but who knows? So for those who want to continue to follow your incredible coverage of this, how can they stay in the loop and stay up to date? Overpriced JPEGs, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. So it's both audio or if you like the visual medium, uh, YouTube also at Overpriced JPEGs on YouTube. That is where I'm posting daily recaps, even on the days off. Like today, I did an, a, a, a video that was comparing statements Sam has said in the, in the past and really breaking them down now in light of what we know in court. But every day that there's court, I'm making videos recapping the day in court. And so yeah, go check it out there. Overpriced JPEGs. Awesome. Carly. You, Riley, on Twitter as well. For sure. I got to say, your your YouTube has been very strong. You've been producing awesome video content. So love to see it. Thanks for coming back on the show, Carly. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate you having me. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for listening in. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.